Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, this is our Q&A session. Um, my name is Duncan. I'm pastor at Bankery Christian Fellowship Church out on Royal D side. And um, there will be opportunity here for us to just have a relaxed conversation um, after the last Well, you'll be session. relaxed. <laughs> the, last, the last session, you, you really set the tone for how this has to go. Facts. No strident questions, no quarrelling, nothing of That's time. good. That's really good. Just he, yeah. Um, but just as we start, just to again express our gratitude to you, Andy, uh -huh. for giving us your time, and we're just so grateful to the Lord for how he's gifted you to, to teach us, and for the ways he's been using you to equip people for ministry over a number of years now. We're just so grateful. Um, we've had a question saying, asking about, you know, how you mentioned that First and Second Timothy are closely related, probably <coughs> written quite close together. Uh, would you be able to speak to them? Well, what what are the differences between the two letters? Why the need for a second letter so quickly? Along those lines. Yeah, I think the first letter is much more. The first letter is much more church-focused, I think, than the second. The second is just relentlessly personal about Timothy himself, I think. Um, it's difficult to know, isn't it, why the second follows the first. Uh, maybe, maybe Paul has got news from Onesiphorus that Timothy is finding it more of a struggle than, I don't know, I mean, who knows. Uh, but I, I definitely think there's, there's more in the first letter about um, how to sort out a dysfunctional church, whereas um, the second letter is more significantly about how to strengthen a, a, a colleague who might be in some difficulty. So I think they play quite nicely together. But I do, I do think it's helpful to, to, to observe the connections between them because I think unmistakably they're dealing with the same sort of events and the same sort of situation. Um, and therefore it's quite useful to, to do a bit of cross-fertilizing between the two. I mean, not, not when you're teaching it, you've got, to, you've got to focus on what you've got in front of you. But it does help just to, to, I think in that business that we mentioned earlier on about trying to construct a believable pattern of what's going on at the other end, it just helps a bit to have the two letters rather than just the one. I don't know if that's any help um, in answering that. So then, <coughs> I guess related to that, just even in principle then, how we approach these letters... Um, as an expositor of the text, you're, you've clearly shown us that time needs to be given to paying close attention to the details, close attention to the imperatives, the connecting <coughs> words, trying to be clear on the structure of it. And it is, it is a, I mean, it's an in-depth approach. We, we, yeah. wouldn't, <coughs> we wouldn't treat any other piece of literature like that, I suppose. No. So... Help us then. Why do we need that level of interrogation of the passage? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, let's observe that we, most of us, most of us don't write many letters anymore. Um, but for those of us who do write letters, most of us have never written a letter as long as to Timothy. And that's one of Paul's shorter ones. Um, and we do, I think we do sometimes wonder, is it fitting to subject Paul's letters to the minute analysis, um, whether on the macro or the micro level, that we do? That's a really good question, I think, because without doubt, we would not normally submit any letter to that degree of scrutiny, unless, unless perhaps... Um, it were a letter from a lawyer to a lawyer. You know how it is with lawyers. They're very picky about detail for reasons. You know, there's money in the detail. Is it legitimate to 
to subject a New Testament letter to the kind of scrutiny that we, would, that we do? I think it is, but I think it's, it's a good question. And I think it is because actually the, the letters that we have in the New Testament and, the let, and any letter that we would write are functionally a completely different genre from one another. And we tend to think because it's a letter, it's like one of our letters. But it's really not like one of our letters. I mean, if we write a letter, we knock it off in... I mean, I don't know, what's the longest you've spent writing a letter? I suppose some of us, if we're trying to write a really difficult letter, we write several drafts and it takes a week or so to to fine-tune it and all that kind of stuff. But it has to be a really difficult letter for us to invest that kind of care in it, how to say something difficult. Um, Even those, I think, are quickly produced in comparison with New Testament letters. A New Testament letter is a really big undertaking. For we do not have typewriters, and we do not have postal services, and we do not have all sorts of things back then that we do now. And so New Testament letter writing is a much more involved process than anything we ever do now. Um, If you were producing something like Romans or 2 Corinthians, A, it's probably a team effort involving a number of people, not just Paul, and not just the named people either. There are probably others in the room and you're going to have to some, have somebody who writes it all down and copies it out, multiple copies of the same thing. These are long letters. Now, a New Testament letter is produced over a significant length of time. They're not quickly produced. And therefore, I think it's helpful to regard them as documents which inherently, as part of the genre, are very carefully worked and reworked and so on and so on. Um, And therefore, the structural things that we see in them are almost certainly quite deliberate, whereas the structure of most of our letters is not very deliberate, really, is it? I mean, we, we say the things we want to say, but not very deliberately, and we certainly don't take seven or eight or nine goes at it, and we don't have other teams and other people in the room helping us to shape it and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm just trying to remember the name. There's a really good there's a really good book on New Testament letter writing. Is it Randolph Richards? Is that the name of the author? Can't remember. But he likens uh, he he suggests that that something as big as Romans would be a massive financial undertaking. You know, uh, a couple of thousand dollars at least in today's terms. It's a really big thing. So I think you know hidden in the word letter, in the word letter, are very different things. And it is legitimate to assume that these are very, very carefully put together, um, not at all accidental, and take, took a long time. So I think it's quite helpful. It's a good question, that, though, because we, we would not scrutinize a, a contemporary letter in, in the detail we would a New Testament letter. I think the way that you <coughs> worded it, perhaps in your first session, is that I said we've got a much more difficult job to do when we're reading someone else's letter, and that it's like listening to one side of a phone yep. conversation. <clears throat> yeah. Right, and that's that's surely one of the things that's driving us as well. Yeah. Yes, it to is. Piece together something. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't explicitly on show. Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly. Right. I mean, sometimes the problem is quite explicitly dealt with, you know, quite explicitly addressed. Um, here, it's. Mm, somewhat tangentially addressed, I think, in this letter. Um, you know, you foolish Galatians, pop, pop, it's, you know, the minute you open the letter, it's, whoa, okay, he's dealing with foolish Galatians. Uh, what's going on in Galatia? Um, yeah. Maybe he didn't need yeah. too many revisions to write that. Well, I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I do, we do have some other questions, but yep. I want to make sure that we do pause just to give anyone who hasn't submitted a question an opportunity to ask from the floor. Struan is ready with a mic, so please just pop up your hand if you've got a question you want to ask. This is your chance. Over in the back here, Struan. 
Hi, uh, my, yeah, my question is, um, if a whole denomination drifts from the truth, what can be done? Can a pastor or denomination be brought back to the truth? And how can the congregation help? Um, I take it by not staying silent is one thing, but then your last talk also spoke about the manner in which that's dealt with. I'm just thinking about the major traditional denominations that have wandered from the truth, and um, is there any way back from that, and how, what do you think? <laughs> Man. The easy ones first, huh? You know. <laughs> I'll be back in 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, what to say about that? It is painful, isn't it, seeing things wander from the truth? It's really painful, isn't it? Um, I take it that you can do the kind of thing that Paul's trying to do here. You can encourage people who are drifting from the truth to stand firm and embrace the pattern of difficulty that comes with that. Folks, you will all know that great difficulty comes to people who try to keep things that are going off on course. Great difficulty. And there are many of our brothers and sisters who've gone through real difficulty in the last 10 or 15 years in Scotland. Real hostility through trying as best as they could to keep things, to get things back in the right shape. Um, what can be done? I think, in short, <laughs> continuing to speak the truth in an appropriate manner. Fundamentally, that's, that's what's required. Often we, we have all kinds of sort of organizational and logistical solutions to trying to do that. How can we band together and make something happen that will fight back against? Um, such things may, may succeed or may not. Um, but I think the right thing to do is always to try and speak what is true and try and do it in a manner that fits in whatever circumstance you're in. Sometimes I think you will end up saying, this isn't gonna go well. I, I can't do any more of this. I, the, I can't make any more than this happen than this. Um, I think you do say some of that in Paul's behavior sometimes. Um, you know, warn a divisive person once, warn him a second time, then, you know, have nothing to do with them. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a sort of wisdom judgment involved in all of that kind of thing, I think. That's not a very good answer to your question, I don't think. It's just, it's hard. I think one of the things you can do is it try and encourage those who've gone through great difficulty in, in doing that sort of thing. Because um, people carry injuries with them that um, are difficult to get over. If a church has um, gone away from the truth and believers are still there that you've been with and they're still under ministry, which isn't necessarily word ministry, um, how do you, in a loving way, protect them? I suppose it's praying for them, but how would you suggest for those who are staying put? Yeah. People often do stay in places that are not that good for them. Uh, amazingly, it's amazing how the Lord seems to sometimes sustain people in things that are not very good for them. Um, uh, I think you can continue to be their friend and you can continue to pray for them and you can continue to engage as much as is possible with them. I don't think, I think relentless squabbling is not in the long run fruitful. Um, And there are often degrees of understanding of difficult situations. Some people are in difficult situations and they don't, they don't realize that they're dangerous and damaging 
potentially. Some people are in those situations because they think for various reasons it's right for them to be in those situations and they're well aware of the danger and those people need encouraging and strengthening and help uh, in those situations. Whether it's a wise or foolish thing to be involved is again, you know, there's a significant wisdom calls involved in that kind of thing, I think. I would say, you know, be their friend, um, keep in touch, keep praying, keep speaking. Um, yeah. Thank you. Let me, let me come back to a submitted question, which um, takes us back to Second Timothy. I'm just going to read the question as it's been presented, okay. and you can make of it what you will. Okay. <laughs> a compelling case was made that this letter was written because Timothy needed it. How true do you think it is that Paul also wrote because he needed it? That's a good question. Uh, you can, there's no doubt that Paul has plans. Um, uh, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but if you look at chapter 4, um, get Mark and bring him with you, for he's very useful to me for ministry. I mean, he's on the way to, he's on death row, but he's still interested in, he's still making ministry plans. So, it's always an encouragement, it's always an encouragement to have a friend on side with you in difficulty. So it is certainly likely to have been good for Paul when Timothy came. I take it from other New Testament data, Timothy did come on side. Um, this is not the last we hear of him, I don't think. Um, is Paul needy? I don't think needy in that's not in the you know, needy sense, but it will certainly be a great encouragement to him to have Timothy on side. But I think that Paul is largely concerned for Timothy's welfare rather than his own in this letter. Paul knows he's on his way out. And uh, yes, he's, he wants the cloak, but interestingly, the cloak is probably not because he's going to be really cold in the winter. I mean, there are other people around who could bring him a cloak. I suspect the cloak is a passing the mantle type of cloak, a bit Elijah and Elisha-ish, that kind of thing. Um, and I suspect Timothy is going to be a significant player in what comes next in Paul's plans. And interestingly, uh, he wants Mark to be... Mark's an interesting traveling companion, isn't it? Isn't he? Because Mark was at one point on side and then not with, but is now back with Paul. So wouldn't Mark be an interesting traveling companion for a person who might have been wavering a bit and is now coming back on side? Mark is very useful for me in ministry. You too can be useful for me in ministry, I think is what's going on here. So I suspect his main concern is for Timothy and for the ongoing plans of the gospel rather than his own particular personal need. Yeah. You mentioned that um, one of the reasons why what you've outlined for us, this idea that actually Timothy needs to hear these imperatives, um, one of the reasons why that's not embraced is just because it sounds so unbelievable to us that someone yeah. uh, with such experience and such <clears throat> a calling to ministry could ever begin to flounder in such a way. Would you be able to then maybe open up then, what are some of those realities of ministry that sometimes might make a minister want to quit? And yeah. particularly, what are those pressures that members of the church might not even realize are the kind of pressures that can tempt ministers to want to quit? Yeah, ministry? okay. Yes, um, two things to say about that. Number one, it's difficult to know precisely to what degree Timothy is in difficulty. Um, I think certainly there is an impression in chapter two that he's got too involved in fighting and might need to push back from, pull back from that a bit. 
it may be, 1 Timothy 5, that he's quite impressed by these people. Um, I think there are a number of features of ministry which make people wonder if they're doing the right thing from time to time. Um, the sort of relentlessness of it, just doing the same thing, doing the same thing, doing the same thing, and people not responding, or people you invested in. I mean, this is, this is a really extreme situation, I think, because here are people that Paul's invested in, and as I mentioned in the first session, almost certainly the named people are people that Paul knows really well and people that he invested significant energy in um, in setting up the church in Ephesus. That is really, I mean, that is really disappointing, is it not? When good people, Demas, he's a good person, he's a good guy, but at the moment, he's in love with this pleasant world. Um, Notice the timing thing there again, in love with this present world. Paul's looking to the world to come. Um, very, very disappointing when you've invested in people and they go wrong. And let me say that's probably, that's probably an ailment of pastors who are further on in ministry. You know, you invest in people back then and a decade later, they're no longer on, on song. You know, how long are you gonna, how old are you gonna be? I don't know, somewhere in your 40s, 50s maybe? How depressing to invest in people who actually go nowhere in the end after a long time. So disappointing. Um, I think that kind of turning away, I mean, let's face it folks, look at Paul's churches in the New Testament. How many of them don't go wrong and don't have real problems? It's very interesting, you know that list of sufferings that he mentions in 2 Corinthians? And the thing that bugs him most is when his people are in difficulty. Um, the churches that he founded are struggling. The, that's the things, I, I mean, forget the 40 strokes minus one, you know, that's nothing compared to um, the difficult and the shipwrecks, nothing compared to the difficulty of people he invested in being in trouble and going wrong. I think that's the big, I mean, I think those are some of the biggest things. Seeing the shipwrecks of people's lives who started well but aren't going well. Um, sometimes I think the difficulty of the prevailing climate. You know, you've invested hard in church life, but look, look what's happening outside. It's getting, things are not going well. Churches are not growing. It's just a kind of, well, there's a relentless cruciformity about the whole pattern that can just get on top of people. I think isolation is a big thing. Um, often people work in isolated circumstances without much support. Um, uh, those are difficult. I think being good, fr being ordinary friends to people with significant ministry roles. People are not often ordinary friends to their pastors. People often relate to their pastors in role. You know, I, re I, re I relate to this guy as the guy who does a job for me and who I bring questions to or complain at. <laughs> whose inadequacies I scrutinize. <laughs> be quite nice to be friends to your pastor, wouldn't it? Just ordinary, horizontal friendship. Pastor is always a bit, a little personal anecdote. I, I remember when I was, I, I remember when I got into, was getting into ministry, somebody saying, be very suspicious of friendly people. <laughs> Which let me say was good advice. Because often people who are gushingly friendly when you first meet them are after something. Uh, I met Dave on my first visit to the church I was a pastor in. He was unbelievably friendly. 
I mean, unbelievably friendly. He was just so friendly. And I thought, you're after something. The truth was, he was just a really friendly guy. And he just didn't, he never related to me as the pastor. He just related to me as a fellow Christian. And it was such a relief once I got over the suspicion. It was such a relief to be related to on the horizontal by somebody in church. The, the role, your pastors exercise a really weird role in relation to you. For everybody in the church, you, they're doing a job for you that they can't escape from doing, and you inevitably relate to them as the guy who does a job for us. There's nothing wrong with that. It's true. It just makes all his relationships really weird. You have perfectly ordinary horizontal friendships in church. You meet them every Sunday. Your pastor relates to this huge bunch of people in really weird it's really weird. There's nothing that can be done about that, but it is really helpful if within that there are some ordinary, straightforward, I am his friend, I want to get to know him, I want to be encouraging to him. That's a really, really good thing. Thank you. I just got one more thing to ask you then. So we mentioned that your role with Cornhill is um, Cornhill training course, trying to equip people for exp expositional preaching, yep. and also the pastor's training course, specifically equipping people for pastoral ministry. Yep. Um, give us a sense of what you're encouraged about amongst the, the current and recent generations of folks that you've been trying to equip for pastoral ministry. What, yep. what are you encouraged about? We've seen all of these things that could discourage us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What encouragements do you see in... in the oh, loads of encouragements. I mean, loads of encouragements. Honestly, it's the best job. It's the best job teaching this group of people because they all want to be there, which is unbelievable. I mean, no, I mean it's unbelie they all want to be there and the churches want them to be there and they all want to learn and it's just great. It's such an easy group of people to teach. So at that level, it's super encouraging. Um, there's a growing, there were growing numbers, which is encouraged, gently growing numbers, which is encouraging. Um, Noticeably, students are a lot further on in their understanding when they start the course than they were a decade ago. And that's very encouraging because it means that really good things are happening at church level. That's very encouraging. And there's a gradually increasing range of churches who are regularly sending people and wanting to equip people. So that I think that there are more churches who've really embraced, if we don't train people for ministry, there won't be any ministers. And that's a super important thing. Um, I think historically we're used to ministers coming from somewhere over there. The denomination does those things, you know, they arrive. But actually, the reality is if we don't train people in our congregations, there won't be another generation of ministers. So those things are very encouraging. Uh, we've got a super encouraging group of students at the moment. About 20 in the first year, about 20 in the second year, 18 in the pastor's training course, and they're just great. And they're working in, in a whole range of different situations, some in very difficult situations, some in much less difficult situations. Lots of encouragements, I think. However, the reality is that the numbers of people going forward for any sort of ministry training in the whole of Scotland will not at the moment keep up with the existing rate of retirement and death. Um, 2016 survey, the average age of a pastor in Scotland was 57. That was in 2016. Which means, well, we're, quite, we're nearly a decade on from that now, and most of those, many of those will be retired now. So, very encouraging things, but on a backdrop of massive need. I mean, just huge need. Um, we won't even produce... Between all the training things in Scotland and all the churches who are training people, we will not produce enough people at current rates to fill the existing vacancies. Um, so, you know, there's a huge job to do. But within that, loads of encouragements. Great. Really good. Thank you, and thank you for being an encouragement no, to us right. today. <clears throat>